Alright, uh, before we get started, um, if anybody's parked across the street here, what is right, uh, the house is for sale? Yeah, well, if anybody's parked like right there, they're having an open house today, so we're just asking you to move your vehicle out of the way so they don't get upset and, you know, try to disrupt the service or anything like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're in Jonah chapter one, and uh, before I get started with this, I wanted to say that I'm, I'm really uh, glad to see everybody, really uh, impressed the way things look here. It's uh, it's kind of different facing this way, even though I've only been here one time, <laughs> last time I was looking this way, and so I had it in my mind that, but whatever, I can distract myself about somebody changing up the, the chairs, <laughs> I don't need that. But uh, yeah, you know, it's just, it, things are just looking really good here, I'm really encouraged by it, and uh, I'm glad to see that. Know, the same people are, you know, keep coming, and that's a, that's a great thing. So we're in Jonah chapter 1, famous story in the Bible. This is not an allegory. This is true. Jesus spoke about it. This isn't just some figurative thing like a lot of new evangelical Sunday school teachers want to teach you. Man. This is the true word of God here. Um, and so turn, keep your place in Jonah because we are going to come back to it, but go back in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter 14. So you're going to go past the big prophets. You're going to go back to four songs. Go back before the you know, first and second chronicles and go to Second Kings chapter fourteen. So like I said, Jonah chapter one. You know, Jonah here he, he makes a, a famous statement after he gets woken up, you know, he says, I fear the Lord. And uh, we're going to take a look at that, but before we get into it, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Jonah. I think it's important when you preach out these chapters or you're reading the Bible. Uh, that you, you get a good context of where you're actually at, right? Because by the time you get to Jonah in your Bible reading, if you're reading from Genesis to Revelation, that's how I do I read it from the front to the back. Not everybody does that. But nonetheless, by the time you get to Jonah, you know, these minor prophets, you might forget at what time period did Jonah operate. And I just want to show you that. So 2 Kings chapter 14, well, let's see, look down at verse number 23. 2 Kings 14, 23. It says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. So that's what's going on right now. That's who's king right now in Samaria. It reigned 40 and one years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from, uh, from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord, God of Israel. Now, now notice this next phrase here, which he said. Spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath Hefer. So that's the time frame in which we're dealing with here in Jonah. So next time you get, you know, you get to this point in your Bible reading, you can know that, you know, the, the kingdom of Israel is still going on. They're still having their wicked kings. They're nearing the end, and uh, and, and, and Judah's still alive. So this is before the captivity. Yeah, I just think that's important to to, to really get, grasp that and, and uh, you know understand that before you you go on any further. And so I'm preaching about a very important doctrine this morning, a very important subject, a very fundamental subject that I think it is uh, basically a make it or break it type thing. If you don't understand this doctrine that I'm about to preach to you this morning, you're going to fail. You're going to fail at the Christian life. You might even fail at your real life. And that's the subject of fear. The title of the sermon is The Fundamentals of Fear. The Fundamentals of Fear. Um, Fear by definition, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says it's an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain, or the anticipation or awareness of danger. And fear is something that everybody on the planet feels. But the Bible speaks very deeply about this subject. If you type in the word fear in the Bible, you're going to find about, I don't know, 500 I think it's 501 times the word fear alone appears. And so it's a, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about it. I just basically broke it down into very basic uh, fundamental things that, that hopefully we can all digest and understand, um, you know, to, to help all of us be able to apply the right kinds of fear in our life. Because there's a right type of fear and there's a wrong type of fear. And this sermon, you know, if you fall asleep halfway through, don't worry. This whole sermon can be condensed into one sentence, and that is fear is a motivator. The right kind of fear will produce the right kind of actions. The wrong kind of fear will produce the wrong kind of actions and their consequences. And so that's what we're going to study today. We're going to take a look at that. I mean, if you add up every single church in this town, every single church, right, including this one, I don't know how many you've come up with, 
probably hundreds, right? Probably hundreds of different churches in this area. And you subtract one. That's how many you're going to find to have the fear of God. And I'm going to prove that to you. First of all, I'll just tell you this right now. If you don't believe that this Bible is inspired, that it's the perfect word of God, you don't fear God. That's okay. You can have that belief. But just know, just know that you don't fear God. And just be okay with that. And just look yourself in the mirror when you go home today and say, oh, I, I don't fear God because I don't believe in the Bible. So just understand that right off the bat. How about make that point number one? You don't believe the Bible. You don't fear God. You're deceiving yourself. Go home. Have a nice day. So let's move on here. So we're going to talk about what fear is, what fear is not. Who should we fear? Who should we not fear? When should we fear? When should we not fear? And we're also going to take, it some, uh, misconcep take a look at some misconceptions about fear as well. So uh, go back to Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. We're going to take a look at how Jonah displayed fear. So Jonah chapter 1, look at verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them of Tarshish from the presence of the, the, presence of the Lord. So here, what, what, what do we have going on here? The word of God comes. The word of God gets preached. The word of God gets uh, told to Jonah, and he just goes the other way, right? Instead of doing what God says, he just runs the other way. Just absolutely no fear of God in that moment. I'm going to show you that here. And so the, the, the first point that I have or the first statement that I want to make here is that fear is a motivator, right? I mean, think about it. God's word came, and what did Jonah do? Did he really fear God like he said in verse 9? In this moment in time in his life, did he really fear God? And the answer is no, he didn't. He feared man. Now, of course, if you watch Veggie Tales, they're going to paint this stupid picture like he was afraid of the Ninevites, you know, because he's going to get slapped with fishes. And look, that's just retarded. Okay? It doesn't say anything about that in here. He, he really, when you read the whole book, he really didn't want them to be saved. I mean, and, and, and this is actually a, a sermon for another time, but I'm kind of getting off on rap trail here. But, you know, you read through it, and you know when, when God, uh, at the end of chapter 4 here, after the Ninevites leave the preaching of Jonah, and they start turning from their evil ways. You know, and, and Jonah's displeased with that, right? So I, I wouldn't say that he was necessarily afraid of going to Nineveh. He just didn't want to do what God said. And that in and of itself is the wrong kind of fear. That's the wrong attitude to have. So the first statement is that fear is a motivator. Fear does motivate us. And the right kind of fear is going to lead us to the right kind of actions in our life. You know, and, and, and this, I know this is a basic thing, but it's something that you have to understand. You have to really grasp this. You have to let this sink into your heart. We've got to have the right kind of fear. Like I said, keep your place in Jonah, but go towards the, the beginning of your Bible and go to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Go to Numbers chapter 13. And while you're turning there, I just say, you know, an example of life that I can think of of the right kind of fear would be, you know, Noah building the ark. The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that he was moved with fear, that he was moved with fear. And that's how we ought to be. And that's the whole point of the sermon is to get us to fear God, to hear the word, and actually apply it to our lives. That's what we want to do because we want to grow. We want to be able to have God's power, God's blessing on our life so that we can really reach this community, get people saved, amen, and, and, and disciple them and teach them the, the ways that God that God has instructed us. So I want to start off by taking a look at a wrong example of fear, the wrong kind of fear. Because remember, fear does motivate. Fear motivates people. Um, Numbers chapter 13, look down to verse number 25. We're going to take a look at the, uh, the children of Israel, right? They went to spy out the land, gone 40 days, and now they're going to come give an evil report. So look at Numbers chapter 13, and verse 25. It says, And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Verse 27 says, And they told him and said, We came unto the land where thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. 
And it's kind of, you know, as I'm reading these two verses here, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, times where maybe you're driving through a neighborhood and you see an apartment complex and you're like, wow, this is, there's no gates. You know, it looks like it might be okay to knock. Uh, you know, or, or, or a neighborhood that you go to, right? You, you drive through and you're like, man, someday I'm not, you know, I, I should knock that, you know, I should knock that neighborhood. You know, maybe we should do some extra soul money. You know, it, it looks great. And then you see, you see some rough looking dudes out there, you know, and you're like, well, hmm, I don't know, you know, the children of Manic are over there. I don't know if I want to really knock these doors. But look at verse number three, uh, I'm sorry, verse 29, it says, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now keep that in mind. That's the attitude that I'm seeking. That's the attitude that we all should be seeking, that we are able to overcome it no matter what's going on in your life. No matter what fears that you have, no matter what uh, the devil tries to do to you, you need to have this attitude that Caleb had. That we are able to overcome. But look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. See, that's the wrong attitude. That's the attitude that doesn't grow churches. That's the attitude that turns churches like this into a mega church over time. That's the attitude, that's secret sensitive. You know, oh, we're not stronger than we. We ought to be more like them. Why don't we just try to be friends with them? Why don't we just compromise? Why don't we just forget what God said and just, you know, just get along with everyone? Why don't we just bring Andy Stanley in here, Rick Warren, and all these other losers like Ray Comfort and John MacArthur and these fools and these people that are sending everyone to hell? Why don't we just do that? That's the attitude that we don't want. So look at verse number 32. It says, And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. You know, and this, this is here speaks volumes to me. You know, every city in America, every state in America has its false religions. I know there's a heavy Mormon population. There's a heavy dirtbag dispensational population, right? And Sam Gibbs is just right around the corner, that loser that he is. You know, but we ought not to let that cause fear in our hearts. Well, you know, uh, uh, sometimes people will say to me, like, do you really want to go to Boise? You know, I heard that, like, you know, 100% of the people Minus, you know, 100% of people are like, you know, either in favor of Mormonism or are Mormons. And of course they don't know. They're just repeating things that they hear. And, it, and I understand that's silly exaggeration, but that's been said. Right? Everybody there is Mormon. You know, it's all fallow ground. What's the point? Well, obviously there's a point because there's a bunch of people that I'm looking at here this morning that obviously have some sort of fear, right? You have some sort of fear of God. You chose to come here instead of go to the mega church. You chose to come here instead of going to the liberal, weak, watered-down church. So obviously we want to build on that. You understand what I'm saying? We want to build on that fear that you already have, that we already have, and, and that's the right attitude to have. We, we are able to overcome the, the false teaching of the Mormons. We're able to overcome the dirtbag dispensational losers at Treasure Valley Baptist Church and all the other Baptist churches that are afraid of them. You know why all the Baptist churches around here are in lockstep with those idiots? It's because they fear them and their popularity more than they do the word of God. That's the truth. That mm -hmm. is the truth, and you can swallow that any way you want. I don't really care. You just need to understand the reason why people become compromisers is because they don't fear God. They don't fear God. I mean, think about it. I mean, think about it. You know, uh, I, was, I was just reading this morning that uh, the NIV changes the word fear when it comes to fearing God into the word reverence. Well, that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And then it's no wonder, it's no wonder why these churches act the way they do. It's just a fun center. I, you know, what's that place over there on, on, the, on the freeway where they drive go cars? It's like a, the a fun yeah, exactly. That just go there, man. Just go there on Sunday. That's a better use of your money than going to these weak liberal churches that aren't gonna teach you a single thing. Right. You would be much better off going there driving your go karts than to go to the pursuit, than to go to Life Church, than to go to Treasure Valley and those idiots over there. Yes, they're idiots. Look, any look. If you've been soul winning long enough and you knock on people's doors. And, you know, you get them to the point where they, they, they understand what you're 
saying, but they just don't want to believe it, that's when you're going to get that righteous anger. That's when you're going to get mad because what that comes from, that teaching, that belief that they have where they can't get saved is from those idiots. That's where that comes from. That's where that comes from. People that don't want to trust on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, they want to trust on their own works and what they've done and the sins that they've turned from, that all comes from these people not fearing God. These false prophets are out here, and I hate their guts. And yes, I hate them, and I want them to die and go to hell. You know what? But what we can do in the meantime is to go out and soul them. You know, you'll make sure that we've got our ducks in a row, make sure that we're living right, make sure that we're in the fear of God, living righteous, doing the holy work of God, and changing people one day at a time. That's how we're going to do it. Look, we, you know, I know the end times are coming, but we shouldn't go down without a fight. And we can fight, and it begins here. It begins with this doctrine. It begins with fearing God. So turn one more chapter over. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Look down at verse number 6. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. When we rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. You see, so we see in this passage of Numbers chapter 13 and 14, we see two types of fear. We see, you know, like Caleb, for example, and Joshua, who feared God. They feared the Lord. They didn't, they didn't fear man. They didn't fear these giants in the land, right? They feared God, and they said, look, we are able to overcome it. If God's on our side, then we're going to be able to do great, mighty things. We can possess the land that become bread for us. And then I like this here in verse 9 where it says, you know, that they're bread, or, yeah, that they become bread for us, you know? And, and, and the phrase there, look at verse 9, I guess, is only rebel not ye against the Lord. Well, how, well, how would you rebel against the Lord? Well, he tells you, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. So what you can take away from that is that when you fear people in the community, you fear to knock on someone's door, you fear to give the gospel, you fear to learn how to preach the gospel of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're rebelling against God. That's what it's saying. When you, you know, when you hear a sermon about getting, you know, the, the TV, the movies, the rock music, the, the whatever out of your life, the drugs, the, the booze, and you decide not to do that because you're afraid of what your friends will think, you're afraid of what your family will think. Oh, you're, you're a fundamentalist now. You know, just know that you're rebelling against God. That's what you're doing. You are rebelling against God. And we are not to be like that. Right? Look, no matter what happens, you get kicked out of an apartment complex, you know, people start coming, you know, protesting or whatever, which I, I doubt is going to happen, at least not for a few years. I mean, I could be wrong, but, you know, you ought not to let that fear. You know what, you know what the difference is between those who will quit church after a protest and those who will stay? It's the fear of God. It really is. That's what's going to determine whether you're, all of you are sitting here 5, 10, 15 years from now. Hopefully we're in a, a building because Brother Mike's looking like he's doing good. He's doing good. All right. Turn to uh, Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. Something I want to bring up is, you know, being being a youth, right? Being young. You know, we got, we got young people here, but we also have people that are young in the faith. And I want to, I want to show you how fear can affect you when, when you're just a youth. So turn to Judges chapter 8. All right, Judges chapter 8, look down at verse 17. So I don't have time to develop the whole story about what we're reading here, but it's about Gideon. And so I'd encourage you to go back and read it later. But Judges chapter 8, look down at verse number 17. Judges chapter 8, verse 17, it says, And he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zeban Zalmunah, what manner of men were they whom he slew at Tabor? And he answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. Verse 19. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. 
And he said unto Jether his firstborn. So pay attention to this. He says, and he said unto Jether his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword. Now look at this next part of the sentence. For he feared because he was yet a youth. You know what? It's okay to be to have that fear. You're going to have that. You're new at soul winning or you're new. Maybe you just got saved and you're new as a Christian or, you, or you've been saved for a while and you're, you're on fire now and you're, and you're, and you're new. You know, you, you haven't grown spiritually. You're a youth. It's okay to have that fear of knocking on somebody's door. It's okay to let those nerves build up. It, it's natural. That is natural. But what separates somebody who can actually execute the commandments of God is having the right type of fear. And we're going to see that. So it says he feared because he was yet a youth. Now look at verse 21. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. So these two wicked guys, Zeba and Zalmunna, they're like, you know, you're weak. You know, what, what's the matter, little boy? You can't kill us? And it sounded like a couple of reprobates saying, you know, just like, you know, what, what, you, you ain't got the guts to do it? But they're actually kind of speaking some truth here. You know, they said, I mean, look at what they say. For as the man is, so is his strength. So as the Christian is in his Bible, because of her Bible reading, so is, so are they. So as you are in your prayer, I mean, so are you, right? What you do when you're not here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, you know, what you do in between these, the, those service times is going to be who you are. If you're only a Christian on Sunday morning, Sunday night, in front of people, you know, when the time comes for you to arise and slay Zeb and Zalmunna in your life, you're not going to be able to. You're not going to have that strength because you haven't done the work. You haven't feared. You haven't done the right things. Um, so keep that in mind and go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now we're going to take a look at another youth in a very similar situation. I know we're reading a lot today, but it's important. 1 Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17, we're going to take a look at David when he was a youth, and we're going to compare that to how Jether was. Remember, Jether was scared, right? It's okay. You're a youth. You're scared. That's fine. But we need to teach you how to get beyond that, how to overcome that. So First Samuel chapter 17, look down at verse number 32. Verse number 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So right off the bat, just right off the bat, you can see David is already different than Jethro. And he's a youth here. Keep that in mind. Now look at verse 33. It says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You know, and I thank God that we have kids in this church, kids in our movement that are able to actually go and give adults the gospel. I mean, that's a great thing. Those are kids that don't fear, and you should let that inspire you. Let that motivate you to be like, hey, you know, if that little, you know, 12-year-old kid can give the gospel, then I can do it too. If they're not afraid, then I don't have to be afraid either. Look down at verse number 34. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You see, David learned to fear God at a very young age. And he actually practiced what he preached. He practiced what he learned. He, he exercised the fear of God every day in his life. You know, and then that's where it begins. It begins with you saying, okay, look, I've got this trial. I've got this thing that I'm afraid of. It's not of God. I'm going to overcome it. You know, I might get my lumps and my bruises, but I'm going to go ahead and overcome this. And that's how David was. That's how David was. David was able to have enough faith to put himself in harm's way and watch God work in his life. And that's how we need to be as well. So jump down to verse number 48. We're going to skip some for sake of time. Look at verse 48. It says, And it came to pass, <coughs> when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And the Philistines saw their champion was dead. They fled. Or, 
Verse 52. But when the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until the come of until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sheraim, even to Gath, unto Ekron. And look at verse 53, it says, And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. So how's that for a lesson in motivation? You know, once David said, you know what, this guy cursed our God, it's time for him to die. It's time to get him out of here. It's time that somebody has the guts to stand up and fight. David kills Goliath, cuts his head off, and then that motivated everybody. You see that 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 fear, and see that's that's what's going to help newcomers that come to this church grow, right? When they see you getting stuff out of your life, when they see me, when they see us doing that together, they're going to be like, "Wow, I can do that. Wow, I can get that. I can give up those TV shows. I can give up those stupid sitcoms. I can give up the movies. You know, I can give up whatever." I mean, take your pick. There's a whole number of things. And look, I'm not up here before you today saying that, oh, I've got no sin. i got plenty of problems. I mean, just hang out with me for a day and you'll see. Right? You know? I mean, there's a reason why it's taking me this long to, to start preaching. But, but nonetheless, what we saw between Jethro and David is that one feared, one didn't. One did the right things in his youth, the other one didn't. I mean, it really doesn't tell us what Jethro did. But what I do know is that when it came time for Jethro to slew Ziba and Dalmona, he couldn't do it. And I'm not saying he's a bad guy. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about him. But what it does say is that he couldn't do it. He just couldn't execute it. But we see that David, you know, he's all about it. He's highly motivated. And that's what we need. Look, we can do more to this community with a group of highly motivated people like this than we can with what the mega churches have, those thousands of people that they have, and all the money and all the programs. We can do a lot more than they can. And actually, Red Robin can do more for this community than those churches. And that's the, that's the truth. That's just a fact. That is the truth. You can't. It's not even up for debate. And if anybody wants to debate it, you can talk to Kate and after the service. <laughs> <laughs> and look, this is especially important for young people. Whether you're a young, you're a young lady, young young man, you're you know maybe you're older in life, but you're young in the faith. You know, you just need to to, to take a deep look in your life and, and realize, you know, am I really fearing God? Do I have the fear of God? And I'll tell you, all of us, every single person in here can work on this, especially me, especially Katie. <laughs> I, I got to make sure that he's awake right here. Okay. And, you know, something else that comes to my mind is, is the government, right? The government's fear tactics. I think it is very important when, you know, when you're young, I mean, for, for everybody, let me just say for everybody, but especially young children, teenagers, people that are young in the faith, that you don't watch the media. That you don't watch Hollywood movies and sitcoms and all this garbage. You know why? Because they don't fear God. Most of those people don't even believe in God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And what you're doing is you are educating yourself or your kids by people that do not, listen to me, that do not fear God. So you, the question I have is, are you going to become like Jephthah? Or are you going to become like David? You have a choice. You have a choice, and you need to make the right one. This isn't a Calvinist church. Calvinism's stupid, right? Right? You have you do have a choice on how you want to be. I mean, think about it. What's Hollywood? What 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 are uh, the, the what's the music industry going to teach you? Do you think they fear God? No. no. That spirit that they have is going to go right through your eyeballs and right down into your heart and affect how you live. That's what's going to happen. You know, you, if you don't believe me, just wait because you're going to see it. Every church has people like that. Every church has people like that, and you're going to see it. So what I want to do now is I want to go back to Jonah chapter 1. I want to take a look at the two different types of fear, two different types of fear, the fear of man and the fear of God. And we're going to take a look at that. And, and you know, more about this government stuff, you know, the, the government, they, they've got their desired response out of the American public, haven't they? I mean, with their media, what, what is it that they're, what is their goal? It's to cause you to fear. It's to cause you to fear. You turn on the news and it's just all this bad stuff going on. I'm sure, look, there's bad stuff going on, right? But it's just constantly, you know, constantly, oh, the bird flu. I don't know if that dates me how long I haven't watched TV. <laughs> you know, all these different viruses. You know, go get your vaccines. You know, you're going to die. And, and then you turn on the, the Hollywood movies and they have the same narrative. They have the same narrative that they're pumping down your throat. You know, fear this. You got you to gotta, you gotta fear everything, you know. 
your, your house is going to get broken into if you do this. Your car is going to get broken into if you do this. If you don't buy these security systems. And I'm looking not against all that. You know, we have security systems as well. Uh, all I'm trying to say is that the government is like, seems to be like, like a big master of pro producing the wrong type of fear in our lives. And so you need to minimize the interaction that you have with it. And, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong to catch the news articles or, or whatever. Just be careful. Just be careful what you put in front of your face. I'm trying to say. So go back to Jonah chapter 1, and uh, we're going to take a look at the fear of man. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 2 says, you know, this is where it says, God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish, and look at this next part, from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So like I said earlier in the sermon, during the introduction, this is the wrong type of fear. This is actually the fear of man. Now, I don't believe that Jonah was necessarily like, oh, no, I don't want to go to the Ninevites because they're going to slime me with a fish. Right? I, what, I'm, what, I, what I think he's saying is I just don't want them to be saved. Either way, it was disobedience to God. It was, it was fear of them becoming saved. It was fear of doing what God said versus actually executing what God said. And so here we see Jonah apply the wrong kind of fear. Like I said, it doesn't matter whether he was scared of the Ninevites or whether he was just didn't want him saved, the point is he didn't fear God enough to actually do it right the first time. And then with that comes the consequence. Because remember, fear is a motivator. The right kind of fear brings the right kind of actions. The wrong kind of fear brings the wrong kind of actions and their consequences. You just need to understand that. So, and, and you know, the, the big problem with fearing man is it's a trap. It's a stumbling block. It's, it, it really is a snare. Go over to Proverbs chapter 29. So turn back in your, you're in Jonah, turn back in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 29. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 29, look at verse, uh, look at verse number 25. All right, Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. And so just think about this. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Now think about it. You're in church, you hear a sermon about soul winning, about how you should go soul winning. You decide not to because you're afraid someone's going to yell at you. You're afraid someone's going to slam the door in your face. You're afraid no one's going to like you. You're afraid you're going to knock on a co-worker's door. You're afraid you're going to knock on your boss's door. Whatever it is. You just need to understand that, that is a snare unto you in that time. That fear of going soul winning, that fear of applying God's word in your life is a snare. You hear a sermon about getting the rock music out of your life. And you say, you know what, my friends are going to think I'm weird at work, you know, or at school, or wherever you're at in life. You know, that there is going to become a snare unto you because that rock music will change how you act. It's going to change you because it does go down into your heart. It does affect your flesh. And it will eventually lead you to doing things to go against God. And, and that's what this is talking about here. The fear of man bringeth a snare. I think everybody should memorize that. Because a lot of people like to say, oh, you know, no fear, no fear. You know, uh, don't, don't, you know, we don't have anything to fear. And we're going to take a look at some quotes in a while. But the Bible says that the fear of man bringeth a snare. It's a trap. Just know that it is a trap, and it's going to ruin your walk with God. And you just need to understand that. <clears throat> so uh, let's see here. Go... To the New Testament, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. You know, some people are afraid of giving up movies, for example, right? Because they're afraid of how their flesh is going to feel. It's kind of like when you go on a diet, you know? A lot of people, you know, like myself, probably need to, you know, minimize food a little bit, um, you know? But I'm like, man, I don't want to be hungry. You know, i got a fear of, you know, being hungry all day. It's kind of like that with sins for us, isn't it? You know, like I know I should get... You know, these TV shows and all this garbage out of my life, but I'm just afraid I'm going to want it too much. You know, I'm afraid that that's going to hurt. And that's what you need to understand is, gonna, is, is a snare unto you, and that is going to hurt you. So go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, look at verse number 18. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. It says, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Now, liberals like to twist that, right, like the Pope. What did the Pope say? I forgot to write his quote down, but he basically said that the fear, oh yeah, he said the fear of God is a gift from the Holy Ghost. That's what he said. It's a gift of God from the Holy Ghost. 
And it doesn't mean that we need to really be afraid of him of who he is. We just need to, to have a deep respect for him. That's not what it means. You should be afraid of God. You know, if you've read the Bible at least one time in your life, that should teach you that that's a lie. Right? And, and, of course, what would you expect from a pedophile? I mean, would you expect anything less from a pedophile? And yes, the Pope is a pedophile. Not up for debate. He's a pedophile. And of course he doesn't fear God. He's a reprobate. He's going to split hell wide open. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And this is the wrong type of fear that we're talking about. Because fear hath torment. Notice that. Fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And what this verse is talking about is not talking about the fear of God. You see, um, a lot of people like to mess with the Bible, right? They want to make new translations and justify them. They'll say, well, you know, this, they'll either say that this part of the Bible is inaccurate because it should be reverence, or they'll say that the verses about fearing God should be changed into reverence. They'll, they'll always want to mix it up because they'll say, well, there's a contradiction because God said to fear not, right? Didn't Jesus say fear not and all that? And yeah, he did, but you got to understand there's different types of fear, right? You're, we're all going to experience fear. And depending on how your walk is with God, you're either going to choose the right kind of fear or you're going to choose the wrong kind of fear. And that's what he's saying here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. Look, have you ever been afraid? You ever heard a little bump in the night? You know, been home by yourself, moms, you know, and you hear somebody rattle on that gate, you know, that does bring torment. And that's, that's just, that's just life. But you're, you know, but this also applies to the Christian life and everything that we do, everything that we try to apply going forward is that, you know, when, when you know that you should read your Bible every day, when you know you should pray every day, when you know that you should meditate on these things every day and you don't, that does bring torment. Let's face it. If you're saved here today, you got to admit that brings torment. When we're backslidden, you got the Holy Ghost inside of you, that's torment. That brings torment. You know, you're just like, man, nah, you know, I know I should be doing this. I know I should be doing that. And it just torments you. You feel better when you're living right. You just decide, you know what? I understand I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be until I get my new body, which we're going to talk about tonight. But I'm just going to go ahead and just work day by day, service by service, week by week, and just get things right. And, and I believe it really starts with understanding these fear types, getting the right kind of fear in your life. And that's what we see here. There is no fear in love. And that's also implying that we should stick close to God, stick close to this book, read this book, meditate on it, because that's what's going to produce that perfect, that perfect love, which doesn't have fear, the fear of man. I mean, think about the mighty men in the Bible. Did the mighty men that slew hundreds of people by themselves, like Shama, said he stood in the, in the midst of a lentil field and slew an entire troop of Philistines by himself? How do you think that man was able to do that? You think he feared for his life? There's no way. There's no way he feared for his life. Or the other mighty men. Think, think about Stephen. Did Stephen fear when he was telling the Jews, you know, giving him that great sermon? He gave him that great sermon and, you know, and, and preached the word unto him, and it says they gnashed their teeth and stoned him. You know, and as they were stoning him, he was still praying for them. That's powerful. That's the level that all of us should aim to become. Because, look, things aren't really getting any easier here in this world, right? I mean, things are going downhill pretty quick, and it starts today. It starts with understanding what real fear is, what the real type of fear uh, we, we should have in our lives. And so I'm going to move on here. We're going to talk... Talk a little bit about this no fear garbage, right? This no fear. I, I you know, I, I can remember growing up and seeing these no fear stickers everywhere. I think my neighbor gave me one. I put it on my little Nintendo. I was like, yeah, no fear. I'm not afraid of anything. No fear. Fearless. But what does the Bible have to say about that? We're going to take a look at that. You know, basically the goal of, of, of that mentality, that ideology, is to get you away from God. So go back to Jonah chapter 1. We look down at verse number 5, Jonah chapter 1, verse 5. Because being fearless, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So, so look at Jonah here. He's just like, I'm racked out. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have time to fear this. Look at verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, 
What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So here we see Jonah being kind of fearless, you know. Jonah understands what's going on. He knows that God, you know, is, is after him. But he say he's fast asleep, and I like what this guy says to him. He's like, what meanest thou, O sleeper? And I feel like saying that sometimes when people fall asleep in church. I'm like, what meanest thou, O sleeper? What meanest thou? <laughs> what are you doing, sleeper? Right, and Jonah's like, okay, fine, yeah, you know, I fear the Lord. That's what he says in verse 9, right? He says, he says to him, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. So he's not, he's not like, oh, no, he doesn't freak out. He's like, oh, no, we're in a storm. We're going to die. You know, he comes back to his senses. He's like, oh, yeah, my fear God, you know. But in that moment, we see that he's fearless about the surrounding situations that he has. You know, and that's, that's, that's a dangerous thing because even though we shouldn't fear man, there are times in our life where, you know, you should fear because it, it can help you. I mean, think about these people that like to go play around with lions and crocodiles and alligators, right? Oh, I swim with the sharks. I like to swim with the great whites. I mean, how often do you hear that they actually get eaten by that animal? That's pretty stupid. It's pretty stupid. I'm not going to go swim with those sharks. I don't care even if it's that big. <laughs> I don't like that, man. Oh no, you know, come up here with a snake. Now nah, I'll be out. I'll run out. I'll be right out this window. Snake <laughs> over top of here, one of you guys. You know, I'm out of here. And some of you, it would be that way with spiders. I don't know. Spiders don't bother me as much. I, I work on appliances, and uh, sometimes I see black widows underneath them down in Sacramento. It doesn't bother me too much. I mean, it does kind of start me a little bit. I'm like, ooh, that was a close one. I could have got. <laughs> We got bit by that or, you know, <laughs> something and had to go to the hospital. But nonetheless, you got to be careful about having that. Well, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anyone. You know, you should you should be afraid of God, for one. You should be afraid of what he's going to do to you, you know, if you go out and start, you know, drinking and driving, for example. Right? And that's a big problem with the heathen. They don't have no fear of God. They don't they don't care. I mean, how many of you know people at your work, you know, or, or throughout your life or maybe in your own family that, you know, just drink and drive? You know, that's somebody that's, oh, I'm fearless. You know, don't worry, I can handle it. I got no fear, man. No fear. I'm fearless. Yeah, you won't be saying that when you wake up in hell. And not because you're drunk, but because you were unsafe, you had no fear. That's what I'm saying. I read this story, it was last week, about these two, uh, these two, this husband and wife team that had a job. They had some, some type of uh, career down in Washington, D.C., and they decided they were going to quit their jobs because they're not afraid of anything, right? They're going to go cycle the whole world. They're going to prove that people aren't that bad, that there's not that much evil in the world. Well, guess what happened? They went to the Middle East and got powerbombed by a car full of ISIS people. I'm just saying, you know, being fearless isn't going to take you too far in life. You need to be careful about this. Oh, I'm not afraid of anything, you know. Somebody comes up to you or, you know, you see somebody walking down there with a, with a shotgun pointing out. You know, you might want to call the police. You might want to have enough fear and be like, you know, maybe we should take some steps to minimize what could possibly happen. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying we need to be fearful, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to die. You know, you're safe. You know, your home's in heaven. You're just going to go to sleep. But don't let that give you this mentality. Well, like, oh, I don't care if he comes up here. You know, I'll take that guy away from beat him over the head. What if you don't? You know, there goes another soul winner. There goes another church member. And we don't, you know, we don't need to do that. We don't need to lose any more members. So this daredevil, no fear kind of mentality is just, it's not wise. It's, it's definitely not wise. Um, I used to work on aircraft carriers and submarines for the Navy, and there's a there's an aircraft carrier called the Roosevelt. If you go on there, there's a there's you know there's plaques and Roosevelt everywhere. And his big famous quote was, "The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself." And sometimes we'll be working on there, and then the the commander, you know, he'll be around or he'll give a speech or. You know, he'll give some kind of motivational meeting to, to those of us that are working there or to, to the sailors. And it, it always seems to come up. You know, we don't have anything to fear. You know, we're not afraid of anything. Well, you know what that translates to? The government is your God. That's what, that's what he was saying. That's what FDR was saying when he said, there's nothing, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Because, look, I've already read verses in the Bible that we should, you know, should fear God. And we're going to take a look at that, you know, in a little bit more detail here in a moment. But the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That translates, the only thing you have to fear is the government. Because God says you should fear him. And we're going to take a look at that. And that's just a, a stupid saying that we don't have anything to fear but fear itself. I mean, what, what does that even mean? But you know who else believed that? Schofield, Darby, and all the other dispensational forefather dirtbags. 
They believe the same thing. That's that's the mentality of the world. The only thing you have to fear is fear himself. I'm fearless. No fear. No fear. I ain't afraid of nothing. I'll, I'll knock anybody. I'll do this. I'll do that. What if you die? You know, there are there is a time and a place to be afraid and actually take action. We shouldn't fear men. Um, here's a quote from John Lennon. He said, there are two basic motivating forces, fear and love. When we are afraid, we pull back from life. When we are in love, we open to all that life has to offer with passion, excitement, and acceptance. We need to learn to love ourselves first in all our glory and our imperfections. If we cannot love ourselves, we cannot fully open to our ability to love others, our potential to create. Evolution in all hopes for a better world rests in the fearlessness and open-hearted vision of people who embrace life. You see, that's the mentality. That's the world's mentality. And that, that guy's a musician, right? Or was. I, I don't know much about him, other than he's an unsafe heretic um, <clears throat> that's going to burn in hell if he's not dead already. I don't, I don't really know. Does anybody know if he's still alive? Is that guy, that guy dead? I don't know. He's, he's, if, if not, he's a walking zombie. But nonetheless, you know, you, you can see that. That's, that's why we get up here and rip on music, because that's their mentality. That's what they're pushing on you. You don't have to fear anything. You don't need to fear anything, especially God. You see, they don't say that, but that's what they're implying. That's their intentions, and that's what comes out. That's what goes into your subconscious and affects how you live, how you think, how you operate. Um, this guy, Jamie Foxx, the actor and comedian, he said, what's on the other side of fear? Nothing. Nothing. That's what he said. What's on the other side of fear? Nothing. Well, I'll tell you what. What's on the other side of fear, for people that aren't saved, is hell. It's God. God says that we should, there is a time to fear, and you ought to fear God. Here's what, uh, oh, listen to this. The enemy is fear. Here's another quote. The enemy is fear. We think it's hate, but it's really fear. Guess who said that? Gandhi. That's what he said. The enemy is fear. We think it's hate, but it's really fear. And, of course, Gandhi's the uh, the famous Christian pastor who preaches the doctrine, uh, love of the Love the sinner, hate the sin. Is that what it says? Love the sinner, hate the sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. And I don't have time to get into that right now. But nonetheless, that's the world's view. That's the world's mentality. And that's creeping into churches all over America that you don't have anything to fear. You can be fearless. You can just be fearless. You got nothing to fear. Well, I'm going to prove to you, you do have something to fear. For example, Revelation 21 8, famous soul winning verse that we all use, says, But the fearful, right off the bat, says, But the fearful, right? The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. Murders, whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice that it says, but the fearful and unbelieving. Why does he put fearful first? You say, well, Brother Joe, what are you talking about? Why does he say, but the fearful? The fearful are those of us that we, are those people that we know today as the fearless. They, they claim to be fearless, right? They say, I've got no fear. That's John Lennon. That's Jamie Foxx. That's Gandhi. That's FDR. They are the fearful. They preach this doctrine that they're not afraid of anything, but they are really fearful. They, 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 you know, they, they are, especially now if they're all dead. And that's what the Bible says. Being fearful in the sense of Revelation 21a are people that are fearless. They are not, they're not, you know, they, they're not willing to accept the fact that Jesus Christ died and paid for their sins. They're just not. And that's what it is. Those are people that claim to be fearless. You know, they're, yeah, they're, 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 uh, they're fearless of everything but God. Yeah. So let's move on here. We need to talk about the right kind of fear. Oh, my mouth gets to be drier. All right. The right kind of fear. Turn to Psalm chapter 19. We're going to talk about the fear of God. Psalm chapter 19. If you have your place in Jonah, you just go back a little bit. Or if you lost it, just open your Bible right up to the middle. It should land somewhere near the psalm. Psalms chapter 19. So remember what we learned. Fear is a motivator. The right kind of fear produces the right kind of actions. The wrong kind of fear produces the wrong kind of actions and their consequences. So let's talk about the fear of God now. What is the fear of God? Because remember, Jonah said, I fear the Lord. We saw that in that moment he did. Yes, eventually, if you read through the book of Jonah, he does fear God. He does actually go to Nineveh. He does actually 
continue on with the mission because God is gracious, right? God is very merciful and long-suffering. But now we need to learn, what does that mean? What is the fear of God? If someone were to ask you, hey, what's the fear of God? What, what does this mean? Well, look at Psalm chapter 19, verse 9. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So, so if somebody were to ask you that, you could say, hey, the fear of the Lord is clean, meaning it's not unclean. It's healthy. It's okay. What that means is when you decide, hey, look, I don't care what my mom and dad think. I'm a married man. I'm going to lead my family the way God says. Right? I'm going to do that. When you do that, you can just rest assured that that's a clean thing. Amen. That is a clean thing. Even though the world attacks you, and they're going to, your friends are going to attack you, your coworkers are going to attack you, you need to understand that's okay because at that moment you have the fear of God. You have the fear of the Lord, and that is a clean thing. You need to understand that, that that is clear. It's not unclean. It may feel like that sometimes. You're like, man, why is everybody coming after me? You know, my uncle, you know, even my dogs aren't acting right, you know, my neighbors, my friends, and all these people are coming after me. That's okay. They're the ones that are unclean, and you're doing the clean thing. And he says, enduring forever. What that means is the fear of God is going to produce results in your life that last forever throughout all eternity. That's really, you know, an exciting thing. You study about the judgment seat of Christ. You know, when you get there, you know, and God says, you know, well done now, good and faithful servant. You're going to realize you made the right choice. You know, you did right. You did well. You, you actually took heed to the word of God. You said, no, I'm going to fear. I'm going to fear God. I'm going to fear the Lord. That's a clean thing. That endures forever. That produces everlasting results. And then the last part of the verse says, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Look, you can trust the Bible. You can trust God's word. You know, the Bible says you don't really need man to teach you. Now, yes, you do need to come to church, right? But you can just, you know, on your own time, open this book, read it, and get great, wonderful things from it. The Bible says that marvelous are the things that are written in this book. You know, and that's a prayer that you should also have before you start reading every day, you know. Just ask God, say, you know, just open up, you know, open up your law. Just reveal to me, you know, marvelous things out of that law. The Bible says, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm chapter 111, verse 12, or verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have they that do his commandments. His praises endure forever. So what is the fear of God? What is it? Well, it's clean. It endures forever. And then you can also say, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, what's wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge applied. That means you, hey, I came to church, I heard a sermon about going soul winning, and I applied that. That is a wise thing. That is a, that is a wise thing. And the Bible says that that is the beginning of wisdom. Because it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have they that do his commandments. Now, I mean, you don't have to do the commandments to be saved. If anybody's told you that, that's a lie. You do not have to follow the commandments to be saved. But when you get saved and you follow the commandments, the Bible says that's going to bring you wisdom. And rightfully so. I mean, think about it. The more you disciple people, the more you go soul winning, the more you, you know, you pray for your brothers and sisters, you help people out. The more you do these commandments, I mean, the more knowledge, the more experience you're going to gain. And you know, and the Bible says that you can learn great things through experience. And, and if you've been soul winning for any length of time, you probably, for example, you probably learned a lot about false religions. Right? You go knocking doors around here long enough, you're going to learn what the Mormons really believe. You're going to learn what the Catholics really believe. You're going to learn what Sam Gibbs really teaches people when they knock on one of their doors and they're like, well, Jesus is only the Jews Messiah. It's not really mine. And it's like, what? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, let's see here. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read this. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. So what is the fear of God? It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's the fool that comes to church and hears God's word preached and says, you know what? That's garbage. Or, I'm not going to follow it. I really think this. Now, in church, obviously, you should be reading during the week. You should be doing those things because, you know, somebody might come up here and say something wrong, you know, or say you start teaching false doctrine. I've seen it. I've been in churches in our movement where somebody got up and preached heresy. Men's preaching. You know, it happens. You know, and you gotta, you got to be able to educate yourself. You, gotta, you and the Holy Ghost, you need to learn the Bible so that you can protect yourself against that. But nonetheless, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Hey, if you're, you're, you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I, I really want to get smarter. I really want to get, you know, just better at the Bible. Do you have the fear of the Lord? That's the question I would ask. Do you fear God? And just take a look at, you know, take an honest look. Do a self-check on yourself 
and just 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 be honest. Do you fear God or not? I mean, it's, it's, it's really a simple thing to say, but it is harder to do. You know what? Turn to Proverbs chapter uh, chapter number 16. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. When somebody says, hey, what's the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord endures forever. It's the beginning of wisdom, and it's the beginning of knowledge. I mean, to me, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty darn important. That sounds pretty darn important if you want to grow as a Christian, you want to mature in the faith. So you better fear God so that you can get that knowledge and you can apply it and gain wisdom and start living clean and turn, you know, gain, you know, rack up those eternal rewards. So Proverbs ch uh, chapter 16, look at verse number six. I want to talk about this, this idea of self-checking yourself. It says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So maybe you're here, you know, this morning you're saying, saying to yourself, you know, do I really fear God? And that's a question that all of us need to ask. Do I fear God? Do I fear the Lord? What would be the evidence of that? Well, look at the verse again. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So I guess the question I'd have for you is, are you making an effort to depart from evil? Are you making an effort to get that iniquity out of your life? I mean, that simple question, well, look, well, just be honest with yourself. Are you doing that? And then this isn't directed at anybody in here. I mean, I don't live here. I don't know what you guys are doing. You guys look better Christians than me. So, you know, amen. You know, I, I don't know. But nonetheless, all joking aside, this is a self-check that we all should do. You know, have I got the evil out of my life? Have I departed from evil? Have I departed from watching Hollywood? You know, listening to the rap, the rock, you know, uh, hanging out with the wrong crowd, the bad influences in life, right? The people that don't believe in God, the people that hate God. You know, I mean, as Christians, let it never be said of us here that we do that. I mean, that, that's, that's going to lead you nowhere. That's going to rub you raw. That's going to take the fear of God away from you because you're going to be more worried about pleasing that person than you are about pleasing God. And you need to understand that. And instead of departing from evil, you're going to run right to it, and you're not going to have the fear of God. So um, we got I gotta I gotta hurry up here. Um, we're gonna talk real quick here about the uh, the benefits and how do we get the fear of God. So I'm up here. Look, get the fear of God. You gotta have the fear of God. Well, how do you get it? I'm almost done. Don't worry. Go to Deuteronomy chapter four. Deuteronomy chapter four. We're gonna flip through a couple chap more than a couple. We'll flip through a few chapters in Deuteronomy, but but I, I promise I'll be I'll try to hurry up. Last last thing here. How do we fear? How do we get the fear of God? So you've done the self check, right? You understand the different types of fear. You're looking at yourself, you're like, yeah, there's some things I need to change. There's some things I need to get right. How, but how how do I get the fear of God? Look at Deuteronomy chapter four and verse ten. Deuteronomy chapter four verse ten. Deuteronomy four ten. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Oreb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn, don't miss this, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and they may teach their children. So hear my words, that they may learn to fear me. You're going to find that phrase a lot through the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Hear and fear. Hear and fear. And remember that. The key to getting the fear of God is to hear, hear God's word preached, right? Hear the Bible, hear it, and apply it. Now turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 11. Just a few chapters over. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 11. So how do we fear God? Deuteronomy 13, 11 says, And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. I'm just going to read the rest of these. Deuteronomy 17. You can write them down or, or get them from me later. Deuteronomy 17, 13. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. The key to fearing God, to actually making the choice to fear God, you say, how do you get the fear of God? It's to hear and fear. Is to make the choice in your heart to hear and fear. Hear the sermons. You got a lot of great men of God coming to this church every week, and they're going to preach different things. You ought to hear that, and you ought to fear that, and apply it to your life. Deuteronomy 19:20. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. It's really, 
It's simple to preach. It's simple to say. It's harder to do. Hear, fear, apply. Hear, fear, and apply. Deuteronomy 31, 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Look, I'll just be honest with you. If you don't go to church, if you don't go to a church that will preach you the truth no matter what the cost is, you are never going to fear God. And most of you know that. Go to these other churches around here and, and try and prove to me that they fear God because they don't. They do not. They aren't willing to preach the truth. They're just not willing to do it. I had an independent fundamental Baptist pastor tell me that I don't believe that all parts of the Bible should be read. Like the part I read this, this morning about David actually cutting Goliath's head off, that really had nothing to do with the sermon, what I was trying to say. I just read that because he told me that. Right? So any chance I get to kind of sneak in a little bit more of the, the, the hardcore stuff, I'm going to take. Because I'm not afraid. This whole book, the Bible says that, you know, that the scripture, that all scripture is profitable for doctrine. You know, for correction, for proof, for all of this, right? There's no part of the Bible that should be that we should fear to read in front of people. None. It's all applicable for today. Deuteronomy 31, 13. And their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess it. Now, last place I'm going to have you turn is Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> How do you get the fear of God? <clears throat> well, you got to hear. I mean, first you got to be saved because the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you got to fear the Lord. You know, obviously you got to be saved, but you need to hear and fear. Just remember that when you're in a situation where, where you, you've got a choice, you know, am I going to laugh at this crude joke at work so that they don't laugh at me when I walk away? Or am I just going to, you know what, this is inappropriate, I'm out of here. You know, you have that choice. You, you, all of us are confronted with situations like that. And you need to remember that you got to hear and fear. You have to apply the right kind of fear in your life. Don't be afraid of the, of the people at work that are talking like that, that are acting crude. You know, you just need to turn them off. So what? They're going to make fun of you. It's going to hurt. The Bible says that we're in war. We're in a war right now. You know, you're in a war with your own family probably. You're in a war with people at work, people at the grocery store, a bunch of faggots downtown that are running around, you know, trying to – you know, throw their pride stuff at you. Right. You know, we're in a war. We ought not to let that make us feel uh, uncomfortable. You know what? They're the ones that need to go back in the closet. But anyways, I got to end this here. Acts chapter 19, look at verse number 11. It says, Acts 19, 11, says, And God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out from them. And certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. In verse 9, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14 says, And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. Now look at this next part. This is funny. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? But who are ye? And I'd just like to stop right there and say, you know, you can apply this the same way. Are you the kind of guy that, or woman that only wants to just listen to sermons online and just be a YouTube only, you know, and then maybe try and go out and, you know, fight this battle? You know what? You might knock on somebody's door that, you know, has their double tongue pretty sharp, you know, and they're going to say, you know, Pastor Anderson I know, Pastor Jimenez I know, Pastor Thompson I know, but who are you? You know, you know what I mean? You just got to be careful here. Uh, look, look at verse 16. I gotta get, I got to hurry up. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Again, we want to avoid that. Look at verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. That's the right kind of fear. That's the right kind of fear. See, when we have victories in our lives, as a church, as a group, as a team together, you know, that's going to cause fear in the community. Now look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it, 50,000 pieces of silver. And that's my sermon. Oh, sorry, go look at verse 19, because here's the result. Here's the result. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. 
And that brings you back to my statement, right? Fear is a motivator. The right kind of fear leads to the right kind of actions. The wrong kind of fear leads to the wrong kind of actions and their consequences. And we want to be like this group here in Acts. You got to come to church, you know, and hear that powerful sermon, fear, you know, and, and be willing to throw all the garbage out, burn it. Because, I mean, look at the result. What happens? What happens when we as a group do that? It's, this is very important. We get the right kind of actions. Because, look, it says, so mightily grew the word of God. And, you know, and, and, and it prevailed. You know, this church here can do that. We can continue to hear in fear, and we can really make God's word in Boise grow. We can make it so the Mormons can't progress any further. They can't raise that percentage of Mormons, right? You know what I'm saying? We need to go out there and get them saved. We need to go to the colleges and get these guys that are moving here, these freshmen, these sophomores saved before their atheist professors get to them. That's how we're going to make the difference. But I'll tell you what, it only is going to start by when we decide to fear the word of the Lord, we decide to fear God. Remember, fear is a motivator. The right kind of fear leads to the right kind of action. The wrong kind of fear leads to the wrong kind of actions and their consequences. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach. We just pray you bless this church, Lord. And uh, thank you for your word and the freedom that we still have to gather here. And I just pray you bless the soul winning, the fellowship, and the evening service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.